הבאנו שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום, שלום, שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום עליכם הבאנו שלום עליכם, הבאנו שלום, שלום, שלום עליכם. You can now come and be seated. You're welcome, come and be seated. You said not to say come and sit. Come, come sit, we're beginning. It could turn into a kumsitz. That would be wonderful. Who here, when you were young, went to something kum, uh, called a kumsitz? Four people? That's it? Five people. Yofi. A kumsitz really meant come and sit, and everybody would bring their instruments, whatever they were, guitars, banjos, drums, little cymbals, bells, and they would come and sit, and whatever songs came up, they would sing, and the ones they didn't know, they would learn, or they would fake, and it would go on for hours and hours, and it would get deeper and richer, kind of like when you're, when you're cooking a good stew, that the longer you cook it, the better it gets, and it was the same with the kumzits. So the words are, Hevenu Shalom Aleichem, welcome. And now you know the words, and we'll sing it once more, only this time with all your energy. Hevenu Shalom Aleichem, Hevenu Shalom Aleichem, Hevenu Shalom Aleichem. Hevenu shalom, shalom, shalom alechem. Hevenu shalom alechem. Hevenu shalom alechem. Hevenu shalom alechem. Hevenu shalom, shalom, shalom alechem. And now that you're all here. Do you feel your, have you arrived? Are you here? Then we're going to begin with the contemplative. And this is Reb Levi Yitzchak's beautiful song to the Rebbe Shalom. Shalom. Ribono shalolam, ribono shalolam, ribono shalolam, ribono shalolam, chvil di radu de lezingen, du, du. Do. Aye, am so echo. Where can I find you? Ve aye, lo am so echo. Where could I not find you? Wo kann ich dich no gefinden? Wo kann ich nicht gefinden? Do. Do. Why do? Wo ich geh, du, wo ich steh, ai, 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 du, ai, 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 du, 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 du. Es geht mir gut, du, Chulile schlecht. Ay, 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 do, ay, 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 do, 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 ay, do. 
מזרח דו, מריב דו, צפון דו, דרום דו, דו 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 דו. שמיים דו, אורץ דו, מטה דו, מעלה דו, דו 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 דו, איי איי איי, דו 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 דו, ואיך גיימיך ואיך שתיימיך דו דו, רק דו נורדו וידרדו אברדו רק דו נורדו וידרדו אברדו דו דו It's hard for me to stand, so I'm going to sit at the edge of the table so I can see the people in the back also. Thank you. <laughs> Got to watch out. Make sure the mic is there. When you began to sing, Heveinu Sholom Aleichem, I was back for a moment some years ago at Santo Desierto in Mexico. And the abbot had just come back from a meeting of bishops And uh, when it came to the kiss of peace in the Mass, he began, Tarara paz a nosotros, Tarara paz a nosotros, which he had picked up because one of the bishops had been in Israel and brought this song back for the kiss of peace in the Mass. What a wonderful moment that was for me. When the angels sing, it is music for worship. Beshira Vizimra, they sing and they play instruments, as it were. Now, if you are looking for that with the left hemisphere of your brain, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But if you can put yourself into a dream state about that, you can understand that there is harmony in the universe. And that harmony is looking to the center of the universe to say, Yay, God. You know, and that's so much what melody and music is about. There were two kings who were meeting because they needed to find out whether they're going to go and do a defensive war, but they didn't know whether they could really afford doing this. So they needed to have a prophet come. So one says to the other, ain't there any prophets here in these here parts? <laughs> and they sent for Elisha, who came, he was a jogger, he came jogging along and there he was. And they say, make with a prophecy. And he said, I can't unless you bring me some music. And say that, so they brought someone to a musician. By he can nagain hamen nagain what a nachalaf ruach Hashem. It was when the musician made music that the Spirit of God came upon him. You see, the important thing about chromatic things in music is we have so many scales that we can go to. But there is a a replication and there is a reasoning in it and the reasoning doesn't come necessarily from the left brain but it comes from the right I give you an example da ra 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 what are you waiting for <laughs> ra right <laughs> the point is that the completion of an octave is what gives music its own 
strength and it keeps going up to higher and higher octaves. The trouble with our spirituality and our way of working in the world is that we are lacking attunement to higher levels. We are so attuned to the marketplace, to the shopping mall, to the traffic, that it's very hard to be able to go to higher places. There used to be a profession that was called Magid, the traveling preacher. Oh, in black churches, it was the same thing that happened, that the preacher would begin, and then he would say, Bahat, and then it would go into a whole musical way in which he was saying. This Magid that I heard was telling the story the following way. Do you want to know the secret of the shofar? Ay, 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 There was a man who lived in a small town. And in that small town, whenever there was a fire, they called out fire and people run with the buckets and did whatever they could do to put the fire out. And then he had to travel to Vienna and he was there in Vienna in the town and he was staying in a hotel and all of a sudden he hears ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Someone is blowing a trumpet there and he says, let's go and do the fire. They said, you don't have to go. When you hear that, that means that they are handling it right. So he says, how do you do that? He says, with a trumpet. And he bought a trumpet and took it home to, with himself. And when he came home, he said, you don't have to worry about the fire anymore. <laughs> I got a trumpet. <laughs> and so it happened that when the time was, there was a fire and he blew the trumpet and Nebuch, the town burned down. <laughs> so do you understand what this is? When you hear the shofar, it isn't just because you're listening to the sound of the shofar. It has to do with what you have to do on the inside to put out the fire of greed, the fire of lust, the fire of envy. Now, do you see, by telling this in the musical mode, he made it possible for people to hear differently. When you hear it in a way in which the music attunes you to another level, then it isn't only the information that you get, but it's also the feeling that this information ought to bring out in, in the heart. And that's so, so wonderful about music. Oh yeah, you're gonna hear good things about music. I did my part right now. Uh, welcome, everybody. And actually, before I introduce what we're doing here today, I actually wanted to introduce our host, the uh, dean of the University of Colorado Libraries, Jim Williams, who really helped make all of this, everything you're going to see downstairs later on possible. So let me uh, turn the room over to uh, Dean Williams. Thank you, David. I. Uh, I have only one purpose here this afternoon, and it's to thank Reb Zalman. I'm just plain delighted to see you all here today. Um, in a sense, this is a celebration. It's a celebration of a life of work. It's a celebration of work that has changed lives and culture. It's a celebration of music and its profound impact on community. It's a celebration of friendship with the university and the university libraries. And it's a celebration of gifts to the university libraries. I trust that you all know that we are now the proud home of the Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi Archive. <laughs> 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 
This is an archive, a gift, a gift of photographs, a gift of papers, a gift of audio recordings, and artifacts that will support both teaching and research in religious studies and Jewish studies from now and on to years beyond. So behalf, on my behalf, as the Dean of Libraries here at the University, and on behalf of our Department of Religious Studies and our Jewish Studies program, let's bring our hands together in applause, in recognition, and in appreciation for the universities and the library's new benefactor, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi. And now let's go on to our program, which we have entitled Embodied Judaism, The Sound of Ecstasy. Thank you, Jim. That was, you just saved me a, <laughs> a, lot, of, a lot of gratitude, I guess is the way to put it. So my name is David Schneer. I'm the director of the program in Jewish Studies and I'm the faculty in the History Department and the Religious Studies Department. And I am inviting each and every one of you to embark on an adventure, an experiment in form and content. The little a adventure that you've all signed up for is happening right now in this inaugural event of a new collaboration among Jewish studies, religious studies, the libraries and archives, and other units on campus. The series, as Dean Williams just mentioned, is called Embodied Judaism. Today's program, because we're working on sound, also involved the College of Music, and I want to thank um, Brenda Romero, who is the director of the Colloquium series in the college. I don't know, oh, you're here, Brenda, thank you. Um, thank you, College of Music, for supporting this project. Today's project, as Dean Williams just mentioned, is called The Sound of Ecstasy. Now, by the time today's adventure is over, you will each come away with a different understanding of what ecstasy in Judaism sounds like, and maybe even feels like. In terms of form, the beautiful voice of Eve Ilson called us to order as we present a new model of symposium that breaks down distinctions between presenter and audience so that everyone here is called to be an active participant. It moves beyond the distinction between study and practice of religion to suggest modes of engagement that give all of us at a university permission to experience and feel, not just to think, and invites practitioners to think more deeply about that which they experience and feel. All of our symposium participants work, play, at this brilliantly creative space where scholarship meets practice. In terms of content, what we're actually going to be presenting to you, you've already heard some of it, we are actualizing a 100-year-old idea that underpinned the great ethnographer Shin Ansky's ethnographic expedition, the largest of its kind to date, that studied Jews across Eastern Europe in the period right before World War II. While in 2013 we may critique some of his methods and possibly his ideology, he collected material to create a repository and a display space, in other words, an archive and exhibitions, materializing the practices and material objects of Jews not for idle speculation, but for engaged inspiration, for people to generate new forms of Jewish culture based on that which had come before. At CU we have built just such a repository whose core collection are the materials of Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, about which you just heard. We call this project the Post-Holocaust American Judaism Archive. By this, we mean Judaism as a religion, a social movement, a philosophy of spiritual transformation in America from the late 1940s to the present, paying particular attention. Is this gone dead? Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. It's okay, good enough. To particular attention to those aspects of Judaism that germinated here in America. In addition, I was like, I know it's not on. In addition to Shachter Shalomi's papers, welcome everyone. I'm not, 
I'm not going to start over. I'm not going to do that to you. What you missed, you missed. It wasn't that interesting. The archive already contains material from many of his students, the first generation of rabbis ordained in his movement called Jewish Renewal. We have publications that ref reflect the creative dynamism of post-Holocaust American Judaism, such as Tikkun Magazine and the Holy Beggar's Gazette, published by my new favorite American Jewish institution dedicated to post-Holocaust American Judaism called the House of Love and Prayer. We hold material from another key founder of post-Holocaust American Judaism, Arthur Waskow, whose material has generally been marginalized in mainstream archives to a section called Jewish counterculture. You laugh. How dare you laugh? Here at CU, we argue that what may have been counterculture when it emerged in the 60s is now defining Judaism. The Embodied Judaism Project, which includes symposia and exhibitions, visiting scholars and publications, and our topic today, The Sound of Ecstasy, suggests ways that the archive can be a fount of knowledge based in the music we now hold in the photographic and material collections on display in the exhibit, all of which, everything we're doing today, was drawn from Rabbi Shachter Shalomi's materials. For the next 90 minutes, you will experience, study, and learn about the sound of ecstasy, and maybe figure out what that means. And then we will be offering tours of the amazing exhibition, Rabbi Zalman Shechter Shalomi and the Origins of Post-Holocaust American Judaism. These two inaugural projects, all based on materials housed five stories below your feet and on the Multimedia Archives website, required huge effort and great creativity. So I want to first thank the curatorial team that put together the exhibition you're going to see, Deborah Fink, Natanel Miles Yepes, Jamie Poliard, Sue Salinger, Andrew Violet, Stephanie Uhas, and to the entire CU Libraries Archives team, including Dean Williams, who actually made all of this possible, both for financial reasons and because he let them actually do this work. So I really want to thank all of you for producing the exhibit that um, we will be having tours of as soon as we're done up here. And thanks to all of you, we'll get to, we'll get a, a quote in a minute, a con, applause in a minute. I will cue the applause. I want to thank all of those who are going to produce the experience we're all about to have. Eve Ilson, thank you. Reb Zalman, me. <laughs> Our visiting scholar, Tufts University research professor and Hillel executive director, Rabbi Dr. Jeffrey Summit, whose incredible biography you've seen in all the communications for this event. Hold on, there's still more people. CU College of Music's own Yonatan Malin, who in his short 18 months here, has been instrumental in bringing sound and music into Jewish studies and in helping us conceive of the possibilities of a symposium breaking down the division between theory and practice, between experience and knowledge. And CU's new Hebrew instructor, Eyal Rivlin, who embodies the connections between language and music, between life and spirituality, along with cantor Michelle Wolf and Joe Lukasik. Lukasik? Lukasik. So please join me in a round of applause thanking all of these amazing people. As we now turn to the sounds of ecstasy. Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> there is a very unique feeling that a composer feels when hearing his or her own composition being played back to them. The closest way to describe it is with the Yiddish word naches. Naches is often defined as uh, emotional gratification or pride, especially taken vicariously at the achievement of one's children. Naches, it's a great word to add to your vocabulary. So a musical piece is, is a little bit like, uh, like an offspring. It grows on its own, then it spreads its wings, and then all of a sudden it comes back to you. So, Reb Zalman, I, I hope you feel and experience a lot of naches this evening. <laughs> and we'd like to perform one of Reb Zalman's original compositions. This is called Bati Legani. The Hebrew words are taken from the Song of Songs, and they mean, Behold, the Beloved stands right behind the wall, looking through the window, peering through the lattice. I have come into my garden. My sister, my bride, I, I have gathered my myrrh mm, with my honey. The voice of my beloved is knocking open to me. Kol dodi dofek pitri li. My beloved is knocking open. 
So in attuning to this uh, song, Reb Zalman has, uh, has quoted Reb Nachman of Bratzlev saying, if you want to hear God's voice, touch the dofek, touch the pulse. It is the beloved knocking, pulsating inside each of, each of us, inside our heart, saying, open, open to me. say something. I want to say something. So uh, just a thank you uh, to David Schneer and to, uh, and to Jonathan uh, Malin uh, for inviting me here. Um, I so appreciate it. And, uh, and Reb Zalman and Eve, um, I'll talk more about how honored I am to be here uh, with you in a minute. Jews have very strong feelings about music in prayer. Have you noticed? 
I know this from the experience of the freshmen who come to services for the first time at our Hillel Foundation. Every year there are people who tell me, Rabbi, I enjoyed services, but you know, you sing all the wrong tunes here. <laughs> so as an ethnomusicologist, I have more of a pass than a passing interest in this. So I ask, and what are the right melodies? And they answer very seriously, the ones we sing at home. Music is so powerful in Jewish prayer. And in this talk, I want to explore some of the reasons why and set a larger context and speak about the role of music and spiritual experience as we celebrate today and dedicate Reb Zalman's archives here at the university. Um, and I just want to say, Reb Zalman, after listening to you at the beginning, I would rather sit in the front row and just hear you talk about this because so much of what I know about this I learned from you. It's difficult for me to express how honored I am to be speaking at this symposium. I met Reb Zalman in 1968 when I was 18 years old, and Reb Zalman came to Brandeis to teach a course on the psychology of religion. Somehow I managed to talk my way into the course. Um, Michael Strassfeld and Richie Siegel wrote the first draft of the Jewish catalog for their class project. I was way in over my head. Um, I had grown up in a wonderful Jewish family, but in synagogues where their religion, uh, where their, uh, religion was, to use Rob's, Reb Zalman's language, over-verbalized and under-experienced. Reb Zalman opened me up to think about music and prayer and the power of narrative with Rev Nach with uh, Rav Nachman's Beggar Tales, I remember. Uh, the concept that you could lose yourself and then find yourself and community and the Holy One in a melody. Years later, I was honored to work with Reb Zalman doing music together at Starlight uh, for a number of years at the Hillel Summer Institute. Um, Reb Zalman planted seeds. And as I look around uh, the people from that time, so many of them are teachers and uh, educators and rabbis and scholars. And, uh, and um, I can't pay back what I learned from you, um, from this blessing of opening, but I try to pay it forward in my writing and my teaching. So, so thank you. OK. Huh. So our. <laughs> Our stories of coming of age as Jews are scripted with music. Parts of our musical identity are ascribed, determined by our history, our locale, and our family of origin. Other parts of our musical identity are acquired as we strategically score our lives, choosing the Jewish music that we sing at home with our children and our friends around the Shabbat table, in our congregations, at our happiest simchas, and at our most difficult passages. Our colleague um, Kay Kaufman Shelame, an ethnomusicologist at Harvard, calls this scripting, this musical backdrop, our soundscape, right? Our soundscape, the oral landscape in which we live. Professor Malin will be focusing on one of Rab, uh, Reb Zalman's uh, nigunim, and in this course, uh, in this talk, I've been asked to speak more broadly about music and Jewish spiritual experience. And I want to share stories, the whole, my talk is about sharing stories, um, of the power of music to underscore meaning in our personal and uh, spiritual lives. Um, I'll touch on larger issues um, that, uh, that have made Reb Zalman's uh, work on davenology, the nigun, the experience of prayer, so transformative over the years. So, story number one, first story. The process of choosing music for worship is by its very nature contentious. We are born into our parents' Jewish soundscape. And as much as we're commanded to honor and revere our parents, the Gomorrah teaches that every generation has to accept the Torah anew at Mount Sinai. So when it comes to Jewish music, this process of individuation is often confrontational. 
and uh, which brings me to my first example. So I became aware of my own Jewish soundscape at Temple Israel in Waterbury, Connecticut in 1958. We didn't daven in our classical reform temple. I remember hearing someone describe the traditional Eastern European davening at the local Orthodox show down the street as a mumble fest. <laughs> that's pretty much how I daven now, but you know, but then that's how they talked about it. Neither did we do the performative uh, um, uh, uh, cantorial music that the local conservative uh, uh, synagogue did. When it came to congregational participation, the music that we used was the Union Hymnal, and no hymn was as representative as the composition God is in His Holy Temple. So when I sing these musical examples, if you want to sing with me, if you know them, you just join right in, okay? God is in his holy temple, earthly thoughts be silent now, while in reverence we assemble, and before his presence bow. I see smiles and some grimaces of recognition. <laughs> Well, I grew up with this music. This was never my music. We inherited it. And as I learned later from my teacher, the liturgical scholar, Dr. Jacob Petakowski, the kavanah, the heartfelt expression of one generation, becomes the keva, the set text of the next generation. My maternal grandfather was one of the founders of the show. He was a proud Jew and an active Zionist, yet he knew little Hebrew. He wanted his worship to be respectable and American. I never understood the power of this hymn for my parents and grandparents' generation until years later in my third year in rabbinical school in Cincinnati, when I was hauled into the president's office because it a poor, this is a true story, all of my stories are true stories, because at a Purim spiel, a number of rabbinical students had performed God Was in His Holy Temple with banjo, mandolin, and guitar in the style of the Grand Old Opry. Opry. If I had my banjo here, I could do a better job of it, but it was, you know, God was in His holy temple, earthly thoughts be silent now. So. Um, <laughs> In the president's office, we were soundly berated by two members of the college's board of governors who, unbeknownst to us, who were in that Purim program. One said, looked right at me and said, when I heard you singing our music like that, I felt like you were stomping on Torah scrolls. I'd like to say that I felt contrite, but we knew exactly what we were doing. We just didn't know there were older people in the room. <laughs> In Judaism's mystical tradition, the Zohar teaches that our liberation is achieved through song in the Tikkunei Zohar. This underscores that there's no more powerful tool to break away from one's parents by rejecting, or better yet, destroying their music. It's a natural process, and it's a healthy one. Making musical choices is one of the first steps towards owning and shaping one's Jewish life. Now, obviously, I went off on an extreme edge on that, but there's an aspect to that that we have to consider. Now, of course, every generation does this, as men and women choose music for worship. In the mid, and sometimes we reclaim things and we bring them back, but I'll tell you, my congregation would have been horrified if someone brought a nigun into that, into that congregation in the 1950s. In the, in the mid in the mid 1880s, when Solomon Zulzer and Louis Lewandowski in Vienna and Berlin wrote polyphonic music for the synagogue, they were deeply committed to reconceptualizing the experience of Jewish worship. These composer cantors created a level of excitement and conflict that altered the musical landscape of 19th century Jews in Germany and Austria at a time when Christians were not known for visiting synagogues, Franz Liszt attended Zulzer Schul and proclaimed that he and his friends, this is a quote from Liszt, were so shaken that our souls were entirely given over to meditation and participation in the service. This is 1859. This was a heady time, and while, while both Zulzer and Lewandowski stressed that they built their compositions on traditional themes, their innovations, polyphonic harmony, complex choral settings, Lewandowski's use of the organ, setting off the great organ controversy, 
were simply revolutionary. Now, these composers' concepts of spiritual experience and worship were very different than ours were today. Among the first Jews schooled in conservatories, influenced by Schubert and Mendelssohn, they wanted to create Jewish music that would aesthetically elevate the congregation, where listeners would be transported by the beauty of the music and the quality of the performance. Today, many Jews judge the quality of a service by how enthusiastically we all join in together in song. But the seminal liturgical composers of the 18th and 19th century didn't want that to happen. In the late 18th century, Aaron Baer composed many different melodies for Shabbos and holiday worship because as a cantor, he wanted to alternate between them so that the congregation never had the opportunity to learn the tunes. Uh, Solomon Zulzer was credited for saying, it was, it's better to have one person sing beautifully than an entire congregation howling like wolves. <laughs> and I've been to that show. But, uh, for these composers, cantors, and choir masters, congregational participation was thoughtful, appreciative listening. I'm not suggesting that we should structure our music around elaborate choral performances, but I will suggest that the centrality of the prayer Shema Yisrael, listen Israel, teaches more than Adoshem, than Adonai is Echad, than God is one. It also underscores that listening is important. The ethnomusicologist John Blacking taught that the reception of music, the creative, critical listening is also participation. As much as we love to participate, it's important to remember that music exists most powerfully when worshipers also make places for silence. Now, the contemporary stress on participation and easy access to liturgical music has led cantors and rabbis to adopt melodies merc uh, mercilessly. Lewandowski wrote nine complex verses to his setting of Lachadodi, as well as incorporating complex changes from verse to verse. Today, it's become common to use the melody of the first chorus for the entire nine verses. Lachadodi, likrat kala, penehe shabbat Lewandowski would be appalled by this simplification. And so would many, um, so are many contemporary congregants. Among the Hasidim, it's common to use different melodies for each of the nine verses of Lachadodi and to build power and intensity from verse to verse, or at least to change the tune at the sixth verse, Lote Voshi. When I was in college, Reb Zalman sent me to Davin with the Bosna Rebbe. I don't know if you remember. And uh, the leader of the Bosna Hasidim. And years later, when I was doing more research with the Bosna Rebbe, the, um, the Rebbe told me, uh, we were talking about that version of Lachadodi. He said, I can't understand how people sing the same Lewandowski melody for each verse in Lachadodi. You know, it's boring. <laughs> You're going to kill the service. That's a, that's a direct quote of the boss. Here, you know. uh, music and prayer shouldn't be boring. Men and women in the majority of contemporary congregations are highly educated, sophisticated, uh, musically with sophisticated cultural tastes. Many people who I speak to could discuss in depth why they like Billie Holiday's early recordings as, compar as compared to her later work, or why they like Yo-Yo Ma's version of the Bach solo cello suites rather than uh, Pablo Casals. Too much simplification in our liturgical music robs Jews of the depth and the complexity that makes cultural and religious experience rich and varied, compelling, and interesting. Now, Louis Lewandowski was concerned with making his new creations authentic, and he drew many of his source melodies from the chazanut, from the cantorial work of his cantor, Jacob Lichtenstein. But truth be told, some of the more important music in my formative years music that framed and defined my experience as a Jew wasn't Jewish music. The ethnomusicologist Judah Cohn writes that when 
Campers in the reform movement's Economowoc summer camp first heard the hammer song, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. On the radio in the mid-60s, they said, why is he playing our music? Because they thought it was Jewish music, because that was the music that we sang in Jewish summer camp. So too, a repertoire of songs from the civil rights movement defined my experience in the National Federation of Temple Youth in the 1960s as much as any liturgical selection or Israeli song that we sang in youth group. When the sun comes up and the first quail calls follow, the drinking gourd, cause the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom if you follow the drinking gourd. The drinking gourd was the, um, was the Big Dipper pointing the way north for escaping slaves. But those songs and Oh Freedom and We Shall Overcome were part of my Jewish soundscape. When I was 14 years old in 1964 and my youth group advisors were driving to Mississippi and beat up Volkswagen buses to participate in voter registration drives, that was the music that we sang. As we protested and marched on Washington, this music signified core values that brought me into Jewish life, a passion for social justice, courage to take a moral stand, a belief that the Jewish tradition was actively committed to social change. And I have to say, Reb Zalman, I remember you using many of those melodies as we uh, would daven together at, at that time and putting them to different hymns and, and, uh, and, and a, a range of different prayers at that point. Now, I won't argue that black spirituals or American folk songs are Jewish music. It's difficult to define exactly what is Jewish music. I usually like the definition offered by ethnomusicologist Kurt Sachs, who said, Jewish music is music made for Jews, by Jews, as Jews. It's a good definition. M music made for Jews, by Jews, as Jews. But that definition might include those folk songs and spirituals, and my gut tells me that those aren't really Jewish music. Of course, Part of the answer here is that American Jewish experience is essentially an American experience. But I draw another truth from my experience with these songs. Passionate music sung with purpose from many traditions has a place in Jews' broader spiritual lives. Ultimately, I think that it's much less productive to put up walls and say, that music doesn't sound Jewish than it is to open up one's perspective and ask, how does that music move my heart as a Jew? Now, Jews should be open to different styles of music. That doesn't mean that we need to be so open-minded that our brains fall out of our head. Once I went to a traditional egalitarian minion, it was the last Shabbos in December, and when the leader arrived at the Kedusha, praising God's holiness, in this minion, you would have expected him to sing Instead, on this last Shabbos in December, he sang <laughs> so, so um, now, as an ethnomusicologist, I got so excited I started running around doing interviews with people. Uh, but in general, people were not happy that he had used Odeste Fidele, so come all you faithful, for the Kedusha uh, on that time. It, he thought he was being playful on that Christmas morning. <laughs> the congregation, this specific congregation, was ready to crucify him. Um, <laughs> It made little difference that Jews have a history of appropriating melodies from host cultures for worship to raise and liberate the melody's holy sparks. The melodic code of this Christmas carol was just too loaded to be acceptable and usable for this congregation. And yet, and yet, in the right setting, in a typical melody can totally reawaken our kavana, our energy. And uh, I remember, and I think it was in Wyoming, I think, but Reb Zalman being with you someplace out west, and you chanted Kiddush to Home on the Range. 
and, and there was something that just made it new and, re and made this synthesis between um, place and time that worked really well. So there's no rules on this, but melodic codes are very strong and we have to be careful how we manipulate them. Jewish worship is the performance of sacred text. And when we choose music for performance, we add levels of meaning to a prayer. Music is a deep vessel, a form of expressive culture that could combine many expressions of identity. The nature of music makes it possible to layer and blend um, uh, text and language and rhythm and vocal style and instrumentation one layer upon another. And as such, you could bring many different levels of identity and identity markers to this, uh, to, to music. I think about these repertoires as melodic codes because the, um, these, gen these genres are infused with particular associations and symbolic significance. Melodic codes could be manipulated in ways, and I learned this from uh, Reb Zalman as well, because we could chant English translation to a Hebrew prayer to Nusach, to traditional chant, creating worship that feels both old and new. And I, I, I think this, I think you were the first person to do this, you know, to, uh, um, to do in your davenology, to do, uh, you were calling it at that time stereo davening. Where, uh, where one person was chanting in Hebrew and one person was chanting in, in English. And it was incredibly powerful because all of a sudden we could understand what was happening, but it was cast in traditional modes that um, uh, grounded us even while it opened it us, us, us up to new meaning. Um, these coded symbolic associations to place and history and family can be strategically embedded in our liturgy, creating richly textured experiences with prayer. Yet in the Jewish tradition, the power of music goes even deeper than personal and cultural and historic. The mystics of Svat believed that the Shabbos hymn, L'Chadodi, had theurgic power. It, it could move God. It wasn't just to move us. Their goal was greater than moving individual worshipers. They thought that music could move the Holy One. Reuven Kimmelman explains the singing of L'Chadodi uh, that's sung on, on, uh, on Shabbat for the welcoming of the Sabbath was in itself an act of unification, stanza by stanza. The performance of this hymn was structured to bring together God and the exile, Shekhinah, God's feminine presence, the masculine and the feminine. The mystics believed that this act functionally hastened the coming of the Messiah pushing the world closer to redemption. And from our experience, we know that music has redemptive power. And I think about Debbie Friedman and her composition, uh, uh, Misha Beirach. Um, Debbie taught us, so many of us, about the power of music to bring refua shlema to uh, full healing to the nefesh and the goof, healing of the body of the spirit and the spirit. I have to say first, when I first learned this, um, I felt uncomfortable singing a prayer asking for healing from an illness. I thought it meant curing. Um, I thought, I didn't believe that prayer had magical power and I knew the section in the Mishnah that says that we shouldn't pray to change things that can't be changed, that have already been determined. It wasn't until a friend sat me down and explained that healing and curing are not the same thing. Our songs and our prayers might not cure a person, but they could surround one with the power of love and uh, the music to give support and strength and transformation. And in fact, Debbie Friedman's music introduced us to yet another power of song in worship, the power of music to change social constructs, specifically in the way we think about gender in Jewish prayer. I think of Debbie Friedman's composition, Miriam's Song. Um, and the women dancing with their timbrels followed Miriam as she sang a song. Sing a song to one who is rejoiced, exalted. Miriam and the women dance, they dance the whole night long. 
Debbie Friedman provided music for a new range of rituals, women's seders, Rosh Chodesh celebrations. And th this was actually, at the time, um, Reb Zalman, I remember you doing gender work before that, you know, on it. But Debbie was also part of the movement and the compositional uh, uh, pr uh, process. Um, and her music reawakened us to think about how women's voices were part of the celebration of the birth of our people, a story that was too often untold until it was told again in song. I just want to finish up talking a little bit about authenticity. Um, Jews are very concerned about what's authentic in music and not. So much so that people will often um, connect our, um, uh, they will learn a new nigun, and then I remember um, a friend of ours and a, a, a student of yours, Lev Friedman, uh, when I did some work on his music, and uh, Lev wrote a number of beautiful nigunim, and when I asked people in his congregation, where was that nigun from, they said, oh, it's a very old nigun. This is a very old nigun. And uh, I knew he wrote it about seven years ago, but it was very important to people because they very much wanted to be able to ground their Judaism. Now, the form is new, you know, is, is old, even if the specific composition is, is new. But it's not just the music itself that connects us to authenticity. I found that Jews will often consider a leader's music musical choices as authentic when they know and trust the leader and they believe the leader cares about them and is bringing them through in an experience in worship. Doug Bear of Mezrich taught that Moses was such a powerful leader because he knew the personal nigun of each one of 600,000 souls of Israel. Can you imagine that? what it would be to be able to know the personal song, the personal melody of every person you came in contact with. The section of the Gomorrah and the Talmud that talks about the essential attributes of a leader in prayer stresses that character and knowledge are more important than musical expertise or a nice, a wonderful voice. I found that the leader's character is an essential element in whether a congregation trusts if the music and the experience are authentic. I just end up uh, talking about uh, a uh, nigun. As much as Jewish worship is the performance of text, sometimes in the liturgy, um, just the words and the volume and the wordiness of it weighs us down. There are times when we want to soar unencumbered by the words, or any, uh, uh, by the Hebrew or by any language. Since the 1960s, Nigunim, and I remember this very much learning this from you, and I still remember um, a room in Brandeis University in that class in 68 where you brought in two musicians who did a Nigun, and I never understood that you could sing a song for half an hour. I never sung any song in my life for half an hour. And that it could be transformative as an experience. Um, and as I, uh, in, in a moment, I want to ask if uh, Reb Zalman would lead us uh, in a nigun uh, in closing. But I would just say that Rab Nachman of Bratislav said that when a chassid um, uh, sings a nigun, you should reach a place where the singer and the melody become one, where you merge with that melody. Those precious moments in life require a level of concentration, deep, deep concentration, and we just don't have them enough in our lives. A conversation with a friend, a vacation with family who you love when you put work aside, hiking up a mountain where one's full energy and focus is directed on where you put your feet. The nature of nigun, the repetition, the unencumbered by text, presents the opportunity to achieve this kind of focus. Yet it's important to share a word of caution. To really experience an igun, you give up control. While contemporary Judaism has embraced nigunim, the people who sing them for the most part all control them very much. They sing them two times or three times, and then they're done. Joseph Campbell said that the purpose of organized religion 
is to keep people from having religious experiences. <laughs> and real experience is messy, and many people have a problem with that. One of the things that I learned from Rab Zalman in my own work is that if you really want to get to a new place, you have to be willing to take some risks. You have to take some risks, and I keep in mind the words of another one of my teachers, John Coltrane, uh, who said, uh, John Coltrane said, if you're not hitting some wrong notes, then you're not playing hard enough. Music has tremendous power. The soundscape of contemporary Judaism is full of voices. Voices, voices, voices. Students talking in classes, congregants arguing in committees. The talk flows back and forth. But those voices are a call and response, a speak and respond. Singing together is one of the few ways that a community could actually experience unity. When we sing together, the individual can hear and feel what it means to blend voice and breath, to create, even temporarily, a transcendent community of palpable beauty and harmony. In this way, singing becomes an occasion for transformation, as well as an opportunity to experience and then model a vision of community, clear, separate voices blending together to create a whole. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about embodied uh, Judaism, and perhaps it's time to actually embody it. <laughs> and uh, for the next song, we've chosen another one of your compositions, Reb Zalman. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the Hine Matov that you wrote. Uh, how many of you know the words to Hine Matov, Woman, I'm Great? How many of you know Reb Zalman's melody of Hine Matov, Woman, I'm all right, great, a couple, of, a few people, good, wonderful. And um, so what we're gonna do, is we'll sing this in Hebrew once, and then we'll sing it in English, and then we'll lie, lie, lie it as a, as a nigun, and this is the part where you're invited to join us. And please take risks, as uh, Rabbi Samet said, you know, if you, need to, if you need to move, if you need to clap, if you need to dance, if you need to add harmonies, wonderful. Uh, to make it a little bit more safe for everybody, maybe uh, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm excited to hear your voice. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm excited to hear your voice. I'm excited to hear your voice. Good. Good. All right. And, and mean that. <laughs> so leave back all the thoughts. Ah, oh, my voice is not good enough. It's not about that. It really is about opening up and joining our voices. So lie, lie, lie would work just as well as the words. For your, those of you who do not know the words, we're singing, oh, Oy, how good, how wonderful it is for, and how moving it is, literally, manaim, how moving it is, and hopefully we'll get some movement. Use this time to stretch or get up or whatever you need to. Um, how wonderful it is for brothers and sisters to, to sit together, to be a tribe together. Here we go. Hine, hine, mato, mato, umana. Dwell in God's house now and always. 
thou shalt dwell in God's house. He shall dwell in God's house. We shall dwell in God's house now. Okay, this is our cue. La la la. La 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 la
Hasidism is a movement within Orthodox Judaism which began in Eastern Europe in the beginning of the 18th century. Hasidism draws on Jewish mysticism, but at the same time emphasizes the ability of every person to come close to God. Lubavitcher Hasidism, also known as Chabad, is one part of the broader movement originating later in the 18th century, and Chabad is especially pertinent here because Reb Zalman studied with and was ordained by the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe in, in Brooklyn. In other words, Chabad is one of the important sources for Reb Zalman's teachings and music. So Chabad Jews believe that nigunim, songs without words, can transport us to places words cannot. And yet, sometimes words can help us bring us to an experience that is beyond words. And in the 1960s, as he was touring college campuses, Reb Zalman set words to a few nigunim in order to convey, quote, something of their inner essence to people who did not grow up with this tradition. Today, I will also use words, not words of prayer, but words that direct our attention to how the melody moves in musical space and time. The specific, the specific power of nigunim within the context of Jewish worship and community comes, I believe, from how they move musically. And I would like to, uh, uh, just, thank you. I would like to explore uh, a nigun from Galicia called Menucha Vesimcha, or Rest and Joy. The music is reproduced in the second of two volumes dedicated to Reb Zalman's Legacy of Songs and Melodies, collected, transcribed, and edited by Eyal Rivlin and Netanel Miles Yepes. Menucha Vesimcha was sung, I believe, on Friday evenings in your childhood home. Uh, we will sing the nigun first a couple times through so you all get to know it and then I'll talk about it. It may help, uh, and it may help as you listen and sing to know that the form, this is the outer form, it's A, A prime, B, B prime. I'm a music theorist after all. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a phrase, a, a section, a repetition slightly varied, a new section, a repetition slightly varied. Now to feel the song properly, let us imagine ourselves sitting at the dinner table with family and friends. We've had a good meal. We are resting and enjoying. There's a new expansive sense of time, Shabbat time, Sabbath time. Nothing is pressing. There are no emails to answer, no Twitter feeds to follow, no phone calls to return, no bills to pay, no work to do. We can relax into the music, soaking in the nigun, as Reb Zalman puts it. And to get everyone singing, I will do a little bit, and then I'll pass the mic on to you if that's. So, um, uh, we'll, we'll just do it this way. I'm going to sing something. I'd like you to sing it back. It's getting longer. Here we go. And die 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 die. Once again, together, and then I'm going to go on. Here we go. Die 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 die. Listen. Die 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 die. Would you like to do it? I lost a little bit right now. Let's go from the beginning. I die, 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 I die again. Yeah, die, 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 die. Yeah, I die, 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 I die, 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 I die, 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 I die, 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 I die. Now the B section. Yeah, die, 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 I die, die, die. Did 
ra 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 de ra 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 okay lovely to continue singing i'm going to sing some more but let's just pause for a minute here okay so we've picked up the outer form you've heard this song we know that it's in this form a a prime b b prime we also know something of the intention the kavana that it is a song for friday evening at the table for rest and joy can we say more about the song about how it moves and how and why we are moved with it the opening gesture creates a musical space it has this note and a note below and a note above um, the notes above and below uh, center the melody on the middle note and we are centered with the melody as we sing yai dai 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 that's where we're centered Notice also that there's an overall feeling of three pulses within a larger beat. Yai, dai, dai, one, two, three, yai, dai, 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 and so on. So we might lean ever so gently on the note above, and the way we, it's, Reb Zalman sometimes sings it. Yai, dai, dai, di, dai, so the syllable can change there on the beat. And we do the same thing with the next phrase, which goes higher. Yai, dai, dai, di, dai. The second phrase is new, it opens out the musical space. The repetition is enough that we can catch on quickly, the variation moves us forward and upward. That's an opening, a standard opening. Now let's imagine again that it's Shabbat, the Sabbath. We don't need to go anywhere. We can enjoy what we have, soak in its warmth. And that's what we do musically. We take the end of the second phrase if you remember the second phrase is ya ya da 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 di da we take that little bit and we repeat it da ya da and again da ya da so this is just just that little bit soaking in it and then we expand it so it becomes da da but instead da 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 you see how the expansion became more melody and then intensified da 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 and then we go back to that little kernel Die, die. Okay? So I've kind of analyzed the melody, but with movement in a way. This one idea is all we need, and it repeats. I've provided a kind of narrative, words that may perhaps touch something of the inner meaning. Now we might sing it with words, something like this. I center myself here. I continue up to here. And again, once more. And then I move with it, just a little more, move with it, and again. I center my, sing with me. I center I myself here. here. I, I continue, continue up to here. here. And, and again, again, once more. And then, and then I, move I move with it, just, just a little more, more move with it. With that's it. all. Okay, that's the end of the A section. <laughs> That was the A section, the outer form. Um, there's actually something else interesting about this phrase. The length is unusual. And we can measure the length of the phrase in terms of its big beats, like this. And I'll, hopefully you can see my fingers. Uh, I sent one, die, 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 what was that? 12 big beats, yeah? Um, so um, it's, the phrase is 12 big beats, that's, or 12 measures. Let's imagine a different version of the tune, a weekday version, if you like. During the week, we have appointments. There are things to do. Time is more structured and constrained. We can't have 12 bar phrases. <laughs> <laughs> or at least let's imagine that is the case. The weekday version might go like this. I center myself here, I continue up to here, and then I move with it, and again. Now we have an eight-bar phrase. It's still menucha v'simcha, but there's less menucha <laughs> and less <laughs> joy. Less rest and less joy. Now let's sing the tune one, one more time, and I just want to, to feel the way we can re-experience its iterative and expansive qualities. Here's the full version again, and you, in, with the added parts in italics, and you can just listen this time. I center myself here, I continue up to here, and again, once more, and then I move with it, just a little more, move with it, and again. 
Now the second, what about the second half of the melody? It does something new. It explores a new part of the scale, a new musical domain. It also has a new kind of phrase rhythm, which is both restful and expansive. The second half of a two-part song always has to differentiate itself somehow. The fact that this happens here is not special, but understanding how it happens is interesting, and it gets us into the inner working of the song. The second half of the melody begins up on this note. Ya da da, up here, and it stays there a while. When it descends, it does so slowly, one step at a time. Ya da da, da 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 da, it takes that long to go down, and then again. Ya da da, da 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 da, all the way to there. So that this phrase rhythm is is both expansive and restful. I'm going to go back for a minute to the first part. And if I could have the next slide. No, continue on. Th what I've put down here, these are the phrase, phrase lengths in the first part. Yeah, that we sang. All the phrases in the first part are two big beats or two measures. I center myself here, that's two. I continue up to here, that's two. And again, that's one, once more. OK, they're each short. Uh, each line was one or two big beats long which we could note what, notate right with one or two measures. In the B section, the phrases are longer, and we might sing it like this with a bit of Yiddish counting in there. Now we sing in four big beats. Yes, yai, da, 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 in four big beats. And say, dry fear, join me. Now we sing in four big beats. Yes, I da 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 in four big beats. And say, dry fear. And so the B section, the B section of the song is also twelve big beats, twelve measures, like the A section. But these 12 beats are divided very regularly, 4 plus 4 plus 4. I imagine each person at the table nudging, looking at, connecting with those right around her or him in the A section of the song. In the B section, I imagine each person looking across the table or beyond to those at other Shabbos, Shabbos tables near and far. That is a way of getting into this individual melody, really getting into it and understanding its inner workings. I presented a musical analysis with your help. We analyzed the music together, but what I've presented is also a musical analysis. The analysis has involved singing and experience. We understand the outer form, hopefully also something of the inner soul. I want to point out that the analysis that I presented is not a general theory of nigunim. It's not about how nigunim go in general. It's not about how Galician Nigunim go. Or it's not about how Galician Nigunim for Shabbat go. It's not any of these. It's about this particular Nigun. And we can come back to Reb Zalman's analogy here. A Nigun is like a person with an outer form and an inner, inner soul. Each person has a unique soul. And if we want to understand a person, we need to know their individual story. It's the same thing when we analyze a song. We want to know the song in all of its individuality. Um, so a few words uh, to conclude. Uh, um, for, well, let me just <laughs> say, we could also develop a broader theory of nigunim, and let me just touch on this very briefly. For example, there are various types of nigunim. There's the tish nigun, or table nigun, is one of these types. And in his chapter on nigun, uh, referenced here, Reb Zalman mentions nigunim for dancing, nigunim of yearning, nigunim for cleaving to God and others. And Ellen Koskoff, uh, in her book on, Lubavitcher, on music in Lubavitcher life, outlines some of the common musical features of Chabad nigunim. Many of the traditional nigunim, for example, are in four sections, and these four sections may be associated with the four stages of dvekut, the dev of devotion to God, and with the four worlds of Jewish mysticism. But my intention today is not to develop a general theory. My intention has been to explore the inner soul of a single nigun with words and singing, analysis and commentary. For those from Jewish studies, you can think of what I've offered here as a kind of midrash, a commentary on the music, which involves both interpretation or hum hermeneutics and experience. <laughs> Jewish tradition is full of texts and commentaries, but there's very little commentary on music, at least very little of the kind of commentary that I've offered today. 
I'm interested in new meanings that emerge through close listening and study, through attention and intention. And I, I believe there's an affinity between this approach to, to music and Jewish music and Reb Zalman's teachings, which so many of his teachings are about making the tradition meaningful and relevant to Jews here and now. Uh, finally, a few closing words to those from the College of Music. The analysis that I presented today in some ways is quite simple. In our professional work in music theory, we often explore more complicated repertoires and offer analyses that are both broader and deeper. There's nothing path-breaking here from that point of view. But what I've offered is different in that I've presented an analysis orally without music notation and without technical terms like prolongation, or linear, or hypermeter. <laughs> <laughs> And the interpretive elements have a place in our discourse in music theory. In Jewish studies, people may, folks might be interested to know this. The interpretation that I offered is a form of narrative analysis. Analysis that seeks meaning by making connections between musical structure and stories. In that sense, it aligns with work by Byron Allman, Robert Hatton, Michael Klein, and others who have engaged with the theory and practice of narrative analysis. The story I told had to do with Shabbat time. Nothing more than that, but it was a framework for specific observations about musical structure and meaning. Thank you. So um, this next song is definitely a joiner, and uh, you're invited to sing with us again. It has four lines. The first line is, it is perfect. Can you say that with me? It is perfect. perfect. You are loved. You, you are, are loved. loved. So we got, it is perfect. You are loved. Let's just say that. It, it is perfect. perfect. You are loved. All is clear. All, All is clear. clear. And I am holy. And I am holy. Okay. It is perfect. You are loved. All is clear. And I am holy. But someone, can you give a kavanah for it is perfect? It's not necessary. <laughs> 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 right there. <laughs> The whole thing, try it. It is perfect, you are loved, all is clear, and I am holy. It is perfect, you are loved, all is clear, and I am holy. It is perfect, you are loved. I think we have the melody, yes? You guys feel like you know the melody and the words? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take it into our body. We're going to embody this. And this chant takes us through the four worlds. We're going to start with it. It is perfect. The world of asiya, of doing, of making. You, our love, the relationship, the world of yetzira, feelings, the heart, the place of emotions. All is clear. The mental, the mind, clear, knowing the world of Bria. I am holy, atzilut, the divine is in me. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to split this room into two. It's very easy to do in this room. You guys are going to start. You're going to sing with Michelle. And then uh, I'll cue us when to come in. And uh, we'll kind of weave our voices together in a sense, kind of building bridges uh, between these worlds. If you want to make any movements with your body to add to that embodiment, please be. feel free. It is perfect, you are love. All is perfect, I am holy. All is clear, and I am holy. It is perfect, you are holy. All is clear, and it is perfect. Perfect. 
respect you. All is clear. And I am holy. It is perfect. You are lonely. I am holy. I am holy. I am holy. I am holy. Thank you. I wanted to say that I grew up in Vienna. The Vienna singing boys are known around the world, and <laughs> and uh, Gregorian chant is important. So Sulza was doing <laughs> On the other hand, Lewandowski was in the world where Eine feste Burg ist unser Gott, ein Keller, ein Nu, ein Kadone. And you can hear the organ. When you were getting your ordination, they were playing Lewandowski's. Tora Tadonai, Temim, oh. And the choir went, Mishivat no fesh, but they were doing in soprano. And it was trying to do Brahms and, and, and Mendelssohn, because that was where the feeling was. So that time when on Shabbos I was making Kiddush to home on the range, it was because I wanted people to get it. That uh, this, this is a day where the seldom is heard, a discouraging <laughs> word. <laughs> because the context is important. Sometimes people are doing Adon Olam Asher Malach. That was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Comments or thoughts from uh, people here? Question. I will, I will jump in a minute while people are thinking of questions. Um, I, I was at um, uh, service with you um, I, when we, you were doing the prayer for Dew recently. Yeah. And I heard a melody and I thought, oh, I know that melody. Where is this from? And I went home and I, I found it. You, can you sing the melody you sing? Remember one who followed thee as to the sea flows water, thy blessed sun, like tree will set, where rivers made of water. But you mean the other one. Kevodo male olam, kevodo male olam, meshortav shoalib. Well, I tell you the other one. That's right. It was a very, very cold day in Manitoba. 70 degrees with the wind chill factor. Below. The, uh, below. <laughs> <laughs> and the only people who came were the old timers there. That Shabbos I was moved to sing. Me him coma. Malkeinu Sophia Vesim Loch Aleinu Ki Mechakim Anachnu Lach they didn't know where I brought this melody in, otherwise they would have crucified me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? They came and said, oh, what a beautiful kedusha you did. <laughs> I have a question because I'm a pagan outsider, so I'm just wondering, is this tradition that you've been talking about today, thank you, Jeff. Um, the tradition that you've been talking about today, is this, um, only in some congregations, or is this more widespread? 
That's a complicated question because, <laughs> because we've been speaking about so many different uh, broad uh, traditions. Um, many of the uh, traditions that Reb Zalman has been referencing has been specifically in um, well, I loved how this is framed, the symposium, because it's not just framed renewal Judaism. It's in post-Holocaust Judaism. It's, it's, it's where the flow and the creativity and the rethinking and structuring of musical choice uh, is, is, is found. Um, but um, it, for, for those who were sort of active participant observers in this, we have the um, the, the music that shouts identity from certain kinds of, uh, of congregational affiliation. But what you've heard is a way of challenging that and playing with that and getting people to rethink it in a way that reawakens how they would approach prayer. I want to say that it's a larger thing. Because imagine if you were to be listening to some monks at the end of the day singing, Salve Regina Mater Misericordia. It is so beautiful because the end of the day, and that, that says, we are about to go to sleep and want to be in a peaceful way. Sometimes the context is very important. For instance, when Isaiah says, what need have I got of your sacrifices? Your hands are full of blood. But in the book of uh, Leviticus, it says, bring sacrifices. How do I know the difference? On the Sabbath day, you are to bring two lambs, and this is the sacrifice that you are to bring. You go to Isaiah. What need have I of your sacrifices? Your hands are full of blood. Get the idea? Those are the cantillation things that are the very much at the core of how we create Jewish music. And uh, it's so funny how it finds its way. The blessing that the bar mitzvah boy makes when he is called to the Torah is, Baruch Hu et Hashem Hamvorach. And it shows up in, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you get the idea. The melodies with which these things were said gave people an idea how to understand it. One was saying, this is, I'm talking about action. And the other one was sort of saying about, I'm talking about the attitude. So that's, that shows itself in so many other ways, yes. I guess I would just add one other thing. I don't know if you noticed, especially in, um, in Jeff Summit's talk, that the 19th century sources were coming from Europe, musical inspiration. And I guess one of the things that we're suggesting with this project is that more contemporary inspiration for the kinds of musical experimentation that's going on is actually happening here and being spread globally from America. So that's one of the, let's call it the, an argument of the way we're thinking about the archive we're building. So the question about is this in every community, at some point I would suggest that in the same way that a Lewandowski, who was referenced earlier, would be referenced in Germany and Hungary and then eventually in the United States, these kinds of melodies will also be spreading more globally. I happen to be once uh, in Oberlin and doing a weekend with the students and I was talking about how it's important to bring American sound to her. And the kids said, all right, let's do something. I said, give me a, a C major chord. And here's how we began. If I forget thee, Jerusalem, let me forget my right hand. Boom, ba -dum, ba -dum. If I forget thee, Jerusalem, let me forget my right hand. How shall we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? 
How shall we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? Im eshkachech, etc. I want to point out that all of this has had to do with the music, the Ashkenazi music. It, it's all had to do with music from Eastern Europe. So the music that developed, including the, the liturgical and the folk music that developed among the Sephardim the, and the Mizrahim, the people who went from Spain to North Africa, for instance, that music sounds entirely different. And their liturgical music sounds entirely different. But if you stay with them long enough, you begin to hear the same emotional patterns work their way through the liturgical music as well. Um, I just want to thank you so much. I mean, there's so much specific content that I'm so interested in. But really, for me, this is my dream come true, which is that the scholarly meets the heart and the spirit. So I just want to thank you, because it's such a gift. And it's rare. <laughs> I think that kind of sounded like a great closing. If, <laughs> uh, do you guys have any last closing comments? Uh, I'm like, hello. <laughs> if that was Many times people say, I pray and God doesn't answer. You didn't sing to God. <laughs> this was more fun than I've had in I don't know how long. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. There's a, a song, Reb Delman, that you that I've I've heard I've heard it on a recording called um, uh, "If If Ever One in One Be One." Uh, that's been the way it, this has been for me, bringing together my interests in, in Jewish studies and music. Yeah. So I want to invite everyone. If you're interested in going and seeing the exhibition with people who actually helped produce it. Uh, Stephanie, I can't, Stephanie, Deb, Andrew, they're going to be in the back and leaving in about three to five minutes and enjoy the rest of your readings. Thank you all for being here. I, th I, think, uh, I think it worked.